How do you become a Formula One driver? Seems a basic question, but it's one that's worth thinking about. If you're a kid gazing at the TV screen and wanting to become one of the fastest racing drivers in the world, how do you do it? How do you go from on the sofa to on the grid at some of the world's most iconic venues like Monza or Silverstone? The simple answer is that when it comes to racing, there's a tiered system to work your way through, much the same with any other sporting pastimes. You go from tier C to tier B, till eventually you're at tier A, Formula One. In recent years, the FIA has been making steps to ensure that the passage into Formula One is a streamlined process. Through the renaming of several lower series formula, we now have Formula 2, Formula 3, and Formula 4. It's a lot more straightforward now for young and aspiring Grand Prix drivers to see the easiest passage to take them up to the big leagues. This is also something that they've done with their new super license system. For those unaware, all F1 drivers are required to have a super license, a designated license that allows them to participate at the upper echelons of motorsport and stop the likes of me from strolling up to the Ferrari factory and asking to borrow the keys to Sebastian Vettel's car. There's a number of other factors in place that also prevent me from doing that, but the super license issue, that's one of the main ones. In order to qualify for a super license, as of 2017, drivers must meet a few certain requirements, such as being 18 or older, owning a full and valid driver's license, and competing in and performing successfully in a select number of junior series. The success of these performances is judged using a pre-designated point system, which awards points based on a driver's finishing position within a certain championship. A driver needs to have accumulated 40 points across three seasons of racing in order to tick off this requirement. Now, these points are earned from finishing in certain positions across the junior formulas. For instance, finishing fifth in the Formula 2 championship would earn you 20 points, or winning a Formula 4 championship would give you a lovely helping of 12 points. Having those requirements laid out allows young drivers to know what goals they need to achieve in order to become a Formula 1 driver and they can prospectively plan out their future of where to race and what they need to be doing. Whilst the FIA has tried to push the F4 to F3 to F2 route, which now that I say it sounds like a very complex keyboard shortcut, they have included a number of other series through which drivers can earn super license points. These range from other single-seater series such as the American-based IndyCar or the Japanese series Super Formula, but also some more out there series Looking down the list, you can find the likes of NASCAR and even touring cars, series which seem a world away from the likes of Formula One, but still count. Now, one series you won't see on the Super License list is the World Rally Championship. And that really shouldn't be an entirely surprising thing. After all, a series dedicated to a championship that takes place predominantly off-road through dusty hills, dense forests and icy mountainsides that requires no overtaking and no side-by-side -side racing with your competitors doesn't really seem the kind of place where prospective Formula One drivers ply their trade in hopes of making it over to the Grand Prix circus. And that's not to say that there are no transferable skills between the two. Formula One drivers heading to the WRC isn't an uncommon thing. In recent years, both Robert Kibitza and Kimi Raikkonen have competed at rallying's top level. Going back even further, 1981 Formula One championship runner-up Carlos Reutemann took place in a few rallies, even recording a podium. But it rarely happens the other way around, certainly not in the modern era of racing. You can go back to the 60s and the 70s, a time when racing drivers were a lot more flexible with their racing arrangements. And we have names such as Leo Kanunen, runner-up in the Finnish Rally Championship during the 60s, who made a brief foray into the world of sports cars and Formula One. And Vic Alford, who drove across rallying, Formula One, sports cars, Le Mans and Rallycross in a remarkable period. And yet, Moving forward by about 40 years to 2009, the world's most successful rally driver very nearly made the switch to Formula One. Well, how did this come about? Why didn't it actually happen? Let's first talk about Sebastian Loeb and who he is briefly, for the benefit of those watching who might have a decent understanding around names and faces in the Formula One paddock, but would be forgiven if they weren't as aware of the details around the world rallying version. For comparison's sake, I think everyone knows who Michael Schumacher is, arguably one of the most successful F1 drivers of all time. 
currently holds the record for most wins with 91 and for most championships. Schumacher has won the most Formula One championships, seven, five of which were consecutive from 2000 to 2004. To compare alongside this, Lope has won nine, all of them consecutively, from 2004 to 2012. He has won the most events with 79, with Sebastian Ogier second on the list with 48. He has the most podiums, the most points scored. You get the picture. There's little argument that he is the greatest rally driver of all time. So how is it that a man so dominant in his profession would even consider or potentially be offered a drive in such a twist of careers? Well, let's jump back in time here to 2007. Loeb's first Formula One run came with Flavio Briatore's Renault team in December 2007 for a publicity stunt which saw Heike Kovalainen drive the Citroen WRC car. This isn't an uncommon thing within the world of motorsport. Teams across multiple series share multiple sponsors, and it more often than not makes promotional sense to have a big media stunt fest with photos and driving and interviews and all manner of wonderful things. And at this particular event, everyone had a good time. Pictures were taken, cars were driven, and interviews were had. What was eye-catching, however, was the pace that Loeb set. Compared to Kovalainen, a man who had just completed a full season of Formula One, peaking with a podium position in Japan, Loeb was only one and a half seconds slower. Whilst you can argue as to whether Kovalainen was pushing the car to its absolute limits during the event, it was still an impressive performance from someone who hadn't stepped into a Formula One car before. It's now 2008. Loeb has wrapped up world title number five in his Citroen C4 WRC. And emblazoned across said Citroen throughout the year is a very familiar red bovine themed logo. Said red bovine themed logo also happily emblazons itself across two teams in the Formula One paddock. Red Bull, Red Bull was the, the red bovine in case that wasn't clear earlier. Red Bull subsequently awarded Loeb with an F1 test, driving the RB4 car both at Silverstone and more excitingly, in the opening winter test in Barcelona, alongside other teams and drivers, allowing the world to make a comparison for Loeb's ability alongside the rest of the Formula One grid. Loeb said, I'm absolutely delighted by this present from Red Bull to celebrate my fifth title. I already got the chance to test a Formula One car last year, but this time the circumstances will be a little different. I'm now going to find myself in the midst of all the regular Formula One drivers during an official test. I just hope I don't make a fool of myself. The fact that Loeb was taking part in an official test session sent the media into overdrive, with rumours that this was a step towards a switch into Formula One, which Loeb was quick to deny, coming out with a statement in which he said, I'd like to clear up any speculation about me possibly switching to Formula One next year. I'm definitely going to be driving a Citroen C4 WRC in the World Rally Championship. After the brief solo shakedown at Silverstone, the Frenchman had a better idea of what to expect when he took to the track at the Circuit de Catalunya and ended up providing useful feedback from his first serious outing in a Formula One car. Indeed, after spending most of the morning settling into the unfamiliar surroundings of the Catalonia circuit and his car, which was an interim RB4 chassis with new slick Bridgestone tyres and simulated 2009 levels of downforce, Lope's confidence was enough to convince the team to put him to more serious use in the afternoon. With the F1 rules switching away from the grooved rubber that had been mandatory for the past decade, Loeb was tasked with evaluating the new Bridgestone slick tyres, and he provided the team with what they described as very valuable data. Not only did Loeb impress with his technical feedback, but he'd shown a fair turn of speed too. After the test, Loeb was being hailed as fast enough for the world of Formula One, setting the eighth fastest lap time out of the 17 drivers and completing 82 trouble-free laps. His lap time of 1 minute 22.503 seconds was just two tenths slower than Robert Kubica in the BMW Sauber and was quicker than current race drivers Nelson Piquet Jr. and Adrian Soutil. I don't think I'd like to take this much horsepower into the forest, Loeb quipped. It was a great experience though, and I had fun, although I have to say that driving one of these cars is tougher physically than driving my rallying car. Towards the end of the day, I began to get a good feel for the car, and enjoy the sensation of it moving around on the track. And I have to say that the level of grip in the high-speed corners is very impressive. Red Bull's race performance engineer, Daniele Casanova, was quick to say that, he expected to be pleasantly surprised, and that was the case. Sebastian has been really impressive. He has stepped into the car and not put a foot wrong from the beginning. However, it would be easy to be swept away and assume that Loam was ready to start work as a Formula One driver the next day. 2008 represented the last era of this kind of Formula One car. From 2009 onwards, the regulations would be changing, and thus so would everyone's cars. 
teams were using this time to adjust their cars and test these new components and regulations. The amount of experimentation going on can be reflected across the field. It was noted that the field was spread unusually wide. 4.7 seconds covered Takuma Sato, fastest in the Toro Rosso, to Lucas de Grassi, slowest in the Honda, which, when compared to the qualifying times of the Spanish Grand Prix that year, where the gap was 1.6 seconds, only highlights the unusual situation further. Whilst it's unfair to compare Loeb's lap times to the same ones from that Grand Prix, it should be worth noting that his best lap would have placed him 19th out of the 22, although only 0.7 seconds away from David Coulthard's Red Bull, who qualified in 17th. And Casanova admitted that it's hard to tell the exact pace. From the fastest car to the slowest, there is a 25 kilometers an hour difference, so clearly a lot of people are running many different configurations, including curves, wings, and tyres. We are the correct weight, so at a guess, I would say Sebastian is running somewhere in the midfield, which is mighty impressive. Loeb was quick to play down his performances, whilst remaining optimistic that there was more to come and more to learn. Maybe I am too old. If I was going to do that, it's something that I should have thought about doing a few years ago. This only came about because it was an opportunity offered to me by Red Bull. You can't compare F1 to rallying. They are so different. It's not true that rallying is more of a comfort zone, because when I am flat out on the stages, I am concentrating just as hard as I was today. I think there was more speed to come from me, but I'm not going to say that I could have gone a second quicker or anything, because I wasn't. There were definitely areas where I could have improved, though, particularly under braking. Sometimes I was braking too early and sometimes too late. I think it's the most difficult thing for anyone coming into Formula One for the first time. For the rest of the driving skills, it was not too bad. I studied some videos before, which helped me with things like the racing line. There certainly seemed to be promise from Lowe, and there were absolutely an intrigue from him to explore this chapter further. Now, the year is 2009, and it's the year of the Sebastians in the Red Bull fold. At junior team Toro Rosso, promising rookie Sebastian Buemi is paired alongside the under-pressure Sebastian Bourdais, while at the main team, Sebastian Vettel has been promoted up from Red Bull, where he joins Mark Webber, who, for the sake of avoiding confusion, will refer to as Sebastian Webber from now on. As previously mentioned, Bordet was entering the 2009 season under a lot of pressure. Paired alongside a very young Sebastian Vettel at Toro Rosso in 2008, Bordet had been completely outshone by his young teammate. Whilst Vettel was playing a starring role, most famously winning at the Italian Grand Prix to become the youngest at the time Grand Prix winner and winning Toro Rosso's first ever race before the main team of Red Bull had even done so, Bordet's season had been compromised by an endless stream of bad luck. Engine failures, unlucky collisions, unfortunate malfunctions. By the end of the year, Bordet had only scored four points to Vettel's 35, but really deserved a lot more for his troubles. Rumours had swirled over the winter break that he would be replaced by Japan's Takuma Sato, who tested alongside Bordet and Buemi. But in the end, it was Bordet who hung on for the drive. However, 2009 failed to start much better for Bordet. Again, he found himself being outperformed by his teammate. Only now it was his new rookie teammate. With only two points on the board, a collision with Buemi in Spain that took both drivers out, and qualifying last by over a second in Germany, enough was enough for the Toro Rosso team and Bordet was fired on the 16th of July, just after the German Grand Prix, the ninth race of the season. It was anticipated that Toro Rosso's reserve driver, Jaime Alcachuari, would move up to the race squad. But as it transpires, someone else was interested in the free seat. Sebastian Loeb spoke to French newspaper L'Equip, saying that, who knows, as long as the Formula One and rallying calendars don't overlap, anything is possible. If there is a place at Toro Rosso, I am available. Toro Rosso team principal Franz Tost was quick to respond, saying that no talks had taken place about the matter, and that despite Red Bull's keenness, he was against slotting Loeb in purely for promotional purposes. However, it's worthwhile mentioning that, in the same interview, Loeb also seemed to play down his own chances of being ready to jump into the Toro Rosso in place of Bordet. Loeb said, A Grand Prix is not the same as a rally. It is 70 laps, and physically, I'm not ready. In rallying, you do not have the same conditions as a Formula One driver. Along with those potential physical disadvantages, there was another large problem looming. At the time, Loeb was involved in a close battle for the 2009 WRC crown with Miko Hervenen, one he was losing at the time of Bordet's dismissal by 57 to 58 points, and would only go on to win by a single point in the end. Olivier Kesnel, 
the head of Citroen Sport, made Citroen's position on the matter very firm. Let me be clear, Sebastian Loeb will not replace Sebastian Bourdais at Toro Rosso if he is transferred. Sebastian has expressed a desire to be an F1, and it does not surprise me as it is a dream come true for him. However, we must not dream. It meant that, considering legal ramifications, his battle for the WRC crown, and the need to physically prepare to adapt to Grand Prix racing, Loeb wouldn't be free to make his Formula 1 debut until the season finale, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, at the absolute earliest. And so, Al Gushwari took the seat. Despite this, several websites were reporting that Loeb racing at Abu Dhabi was a done deal, and that him racing in 2010 was highly likely. Fast forward to October, and Lowe was back behind the wheel of a race car again, only this time it was a GP2, well, the Formula 2 equivalent at the time, car, at a test session in Jerez. Rumours seemed to suggest this was part of a warm-up towards Toro Rosso replacing Al Gashwari for the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Loeb insisted this wasn't the case. On his official website, Loeb indicated that the team had come about through some connections with the race engineers of the Almeres team, who had run him in a few Porsche Cup races in France the previous year. One of the engineers supposedly now worked for DPR, the team who ran Loeb in the GP2 test. Knowing that Loeb was keen on driving different and various types of race cars, he talked DPR into inviting Loeb to come and drive. Loeb himself told Autosport, I'm just doing this because I have the chance. I would like to do the F1 race, but nothing has changed. It's the same every day. Unfortunately for Loeb, his outing at Jerez didn't help his F1 aspirations and possibly hindered them further. Out of 25 drivers, Loeb was 18th in the morning on a damp track, but as the track dried up, he tumbled down the order and finished the test in dead last, with a lap time of 1 minute 28.114. Loeb was 2.2 seconds off the pace of leading driver, then Japanese Formula 3 champion and future Formula 1 driver Marcus Ericsson, and 0.8 seconds behind fellow DPR tester Romanian Michael Herc, who at the time had raced in 32 GP2 races and failed to score a point. It should be pointed out, however, that Loeb had managed to whittle the gap to Herc from 1.5 seconds down to 0.8, and that the team Loeb was driving for, DPR, hadn't won a GP2 race since 2005, and had finished last in the standings in 2008 and 2009, scoring no points in the latter. Regardless of the situation and the undoubted experience gained, it didn't paint Loeb's talents in a good light, and after all the hype of his supposed F1 debut surely upcoming, there were a lot of murmurings now in the press about whether they had taken a step backwards. If Loeb was that far off the pace in a GP2 car, how would he manage in a Formula 1 car? As it happens, the situation all came to a head on the 21st of October. Formula 1's governing body denied Loeb his mandatory super licence. But hey, a super licence! Remember when we spoke about that at the beginning? What a fun little callback. On the grounds that he did not fulfil the necessary criteria namely that he had not done enough circuit racing at a lower level. Loeb was understandably disappointed. As he puts it himself, I told myself that I will probably only have one opportunity like this in my life. I did not get the super license this time, and I do not see how I could get it without preparation and the necessary tests in Formula 1. Finding an opportunity like that again seems very unlikely. All this put together, I do not think this opportunity will present itself again. There does also seem to be some conjecture about whether Loeb would have raced in Abu Dhabi even if he had secured the necessary super license, or if he would have turned down that opportunity. Also, according to Loeb, I would have been driving for Toro Rosso, and that wasn't a car that could have won, so I wasn't prepared to do it. I would have gotten the car at Abu Dhabi in 2009 and driven the race without any advanced practice sessions. It's understandable if the lack of practice time and the uncompetitive nature of the car would have deterred Loeb on the grounds that it would have made making his debut extremely hard. There were apparently brief discussions with the new USF1 team, a team that I would love to delve into further depth to at another time. Reportedly, Loeb's agents had been in touch with the team, with USF1 sporting director Peter Windsor stating that somebody called us, the name being Sebastian Loeb. Real subtle there, Peter. But it's not for me to give you details of that conversation. Loeb has an incredible track record in rallying and would surely bring attention to F1. We are seeking the American side, for at the time USF1 was seeking an American only driver lineup, but we will still consider his profile. Loeb responded by stating The Toro Rosso team has previously inquired whether I really wanted to do Formula One. So, out of curiosity, I want to know if I could integrate. People around me have made contact with this new team, but I do not know what the reply was. As it happens, USF1 never made the grid, but it seems that nothing came of their conversation with Loeb either. And with that, the Formula One dream was over for Sebastian Loeb. 
it was back to the WRC for 2010, a championship he swept to, and followed that up with two further titles in 2011 and 2012. At the end of 2012, he retired from full-time rallying, but has still been an active participant on the rallying scene, notably winning the 2018 Spanish Rally to become the third oldest WRC winner at 44 years and 214 days. He's also raced in the World Touring Car Championship, finishing third overall in both 2014 and 2015, and taking part in numerous other series, such as the Dakar Rally and the World Rally Cross Championship. So how would Lope have done at the wheel of a Formula One car? Obviously, it's difficult to judge based on the limited data and evidence we have. There are a lot of promising signs, but all seem to come with some sort of caveat alongside. Promising tests, strong showings of pace, explained away with the difficulty of judging testing times in such a transitional period for Formula One. And likewise, that seemingly disastrous GP2 test, which, whilst it perhaps has the fewest caveats around it, and thus could be argued as the truest indication of Loeb's pace, can still be argued against the tricky damp conditions on the day and the less than competitive car he was in. As Loeb puts it himself, I take things as they come. My only regret I have is that I'd have fun doing it. It was a fun project, but hey, that's how it is. I think Alain Prost, four-time world champion, sums it up very nicely. It would have been unique and incredible for all fans of motorsport but such a shame to risk his reputation. It would have been absolutely impossible for him to be competitive on a circuit which he doesn't know when all he has done is rallying throughout his career. That is not to put him down, on the contrary. But Formula One is not just any old thing. It is a completely different mountain to climb.